Welcome everyone to Nova Forum Seminar 6, our final meeting together on the topic fantasy and critique utopian politics. So that we've arrived now after thinking about the Christian imaginations of the future, of our future on earth and our future after our death and the Catholic imagination. What is the Catholic imagination? What are some other imaginations of the future in other ancient modes of thought? We also consider about the formation of communities that reflect these notions of uh, future hopes together, um, both on earth and beyond our life and the art that reflects that we considered as well. And then we turn to Thomas More's Utopia and to Dante edging a little bit further up to the 21st century. We considered science fiction as a genre coming out of this sort of tradition last time. And now finally, here we are arrived in the present more or less, or at least thinking in the present, with our two guests, Professor Jason Blakely, one of our senior fellows from Pepperdine University on Thomas More and Christian Utopian Humanism, Catholic Utopian Humanism, and our second session hosting Father Gregory Boyle, a Jesuit priest in Los Angeles and uh, really nationally renowned and world renowned for his work with gang intervention at Homeboy Industries in downtown Los Angeles called Hope in Los Angeles. How do we think about the prospects or the limits um, of hope and what Father Boyle calls radical kinship as a kind of mode of utopian, not just thinking but practice here in our city and in our year, in our decade. So without further ado, I'm going to briefly introduce my colleague, Jason Blakely, and then we'll hear from him. So, Jason Blakely is professor, associate professor of political science at Pepperdine University, having taken his PhD at Berkeley and studied at Vassar before that. He's the author of several books, and I've got two of them here because I've been studying Blakely, as all of you should. Alistair McIntyre, Charles Taylor, and the Demise of Naturalism, University of Notre Dame Press. And most recently, and to great acclaim, We Built Reality, How Social Science Infiltrated Culture, Politics, and Power. And just last week, we had a wonderful webinar with Lumen Christi Institute at the University of Chicago that was a dialogue between Professor Blakely and Patricia Nanz, who's a scholar in Berlin, and Charles Taylor himself, who I think is in his late 80s, but was uh, the most energy, I mean, with no, uh, <laughs> nothing against Jason, but was perhaps the most energetic thinker present at the, at the, uh, the dialogue and had some wonderful things to say about the value of Jason's work and rethinking how we approach social science, what sort of human being does social science depict, what sort of vision of the world does it accidentally not only theorize, but perhaps put into play and put into practice. And Jason's been uh, kind enough to share with us some of his own thinking in his next chapter of scholarship on Catholic utopianism with a meditation on Thomas More that we've been reading together. So if you've got your books, this is a good time to get them out. And we, we prepared a couple pages uh, that Jason directed us toward, starting at page 33, I believe. But I'm going to stop there and hand over the floor to my esteemed colleague. Thank you, David. Good morning to the junior and to the senior fellows. And yes, we have one last chance to think about Thomas More's uh, sort of epoch making, puzzling, mystifying text, Utopia from 1516, that is sort of at the heart of the creation and uh, development, not only of a concept, but of an entire genre of uh, political thought. And I, like David said, I just wanna share with you guys a little bit from a project that I'm working on. This is part of a larger project on a kind of philosophical archeology span of what kinds of knowledge and forms of knowing uh, existed before the advent of modern political science and it's kind of mechanistic and ahistorical views. So I'm interested in the humanists and Thomas More in particular for that reason. This is just a small part of that project. Now you may remember that Utopia opens with a failed trip 
basically to try to resolve the problems of the heads of state of Europe on certain questions of tariffs. And we know from scholars that this is actually based on a true trip that Thomas More made to Bruges and it fails. They don't get anywhere. And so Thomas More makes this side jaunt to Antwerp. And in Antwerp, he meets up with Peter Giles. And Peter Giles is, of course, uh, the friend of Erasmus and an actual historical person that was also a friend of Thomas More's. And while there, uh, they go to Mass, which I think is very close to the concerns of Nova Form. They go to Mass and they sort of reshape, if you like, within the Catholic tradition, they reshape their hearts and minds toward an orientation toward the heavenly city and toward God. And right when that happens, they walk out of mass and they run into Raphael Heifelade, this really weird traveler uh, from the new world who's been in the new world. And Raphael, of course, has the name of the archangel and so on, um, but he's also a humanist. And so I just want to start out by noting and drawing your attention to the fact that more prepares us to hear about utopia by first exiting the sort of dysfunction and failure of European high state affairs and into two parallel rival communities, the rival community of the Catholic Church and its liturgies that go beyond any one sovereign, any one secular sovereign, and also the new the nascent community of Renaissance humanists that is a kind of community, a pan-European community, also outside of the particular failures. There's a kind of friendship there between Erasmus, Peter, and Thomas. So I just want to share with you guys some, some fairly brief thoughts and then open it to discussion. Debate over what the heck utopia means is pretty longstanding and ferocious in, in the scholarship. There are generally speaking two tendencies in at least the modern scholarship. On the one side, people, there are people like C.S. Lewis, whose photograph you see up there, who tend to try to interpret uh, Thomas More's utopia as a conservative document. Uh, they tend to stress the irony. Thomas More had a great genius for irony and satire. They tend to stress the sort of complex dialogical and polyvocal elements. They tend to emphasize Morris's, uh, Morris being the Latin of Thomas More's name, uh, Aristotelian critiques of, of the abolition of private property. And these readers also, in a sense, turn utopia into a cautionary tale so that paradoxically, utopia becomes the first anti-utopian text and a text in realism. On the other side, we have uh, radicalizers, and I put up the photograph there of Eric Nelson, who we had the great fortune to have come speak to us, um, the, the historian of political thought. And radicalizing readings have, like Nelson's, have tended to place more in historical context and observe things like, well, the Erasmian circle was uh, quite enthusiastic about platonic communism, about a community of property was very critical of Roman notions of law and private property. And so it was a commonplace among Erasmus and his friends to think that the ideal society would be radically different than European society. Other radicalizing readers like uh, the, the Marxist, neo-Marxist Frederick Jameson have noted that Thomas More's utopia is concerned with totality, a totality that is completely separate and other than existing societies. I am concerned with initially actually a third way that is neither a conservative um, anti-utopian tract nor a sort of radicalizing uh, a tract that is committed to certain institutional and doctrinal features of platonic uh, community of property. I think that these tend to reflect really 20th century anxieties, uh, mostly having to do with the Cold War and our own modern political ideologies. And that the problem with this focus on doctrine and institutions and sort of the overheated discussion over property is that it misses what's really fundamentally Thomas More's genius, which is not prim primarily doctrinal, but a whole new way of thinking. 
and that this whole new way of thinking, I'm going to call utopia. So utopia is a mode of thought. And this mode of thought is primarily interpretive or hermeneutic. And what I mean by that is that it views political and social life as comprised of historical and cultural meanings. I'll say that one more time for those who aren't familiar with the term hermeneutics. Thomas More's big breakthrough is to have invented, if you like, a concept, utopia, that conceptualizes politics as primarily about historical and cultural meanings and the interpretation of historical and cultural meanings. So how is this uh, sort of um, big innovation? I'm going to talk about it to this morning in four senses, four ways in which this is uh, a big breakthrough. And then I will circle back to the debate between sort of conservative scholarship and radicalizing scholarship. And because I think that taking a kind of interpretive or hermeneutic perspective on utopia sheds light on these two tendencies. The first sense, utopia as world making or social ontology. Ontology is a philosophical term that just is a branch of philosophy that deals with the nature of reality. So when I say social ontology, I mean the nature of social reality. In other words, one of the big breakthroughs I hope you guys can see from my remarks is that Moore's concept of utopia changes the way we conceptualize or think about what social reality is, what the realities around us are, this seminar we're doing, the institutions around us, um, the cultural practices, et cetera, et cetera. What you see up on your screen right now on the left-hand side is a detail from a 16th century drawing of the social imaginary that dominated the Middle Ages. It is a drawing of this, the great chain of being. The great chain of being was very briefly this medieval notion that God sat sovereign within the cosmos and that there was a kind of um, echo of regime type down through human society, you can see there in the next notch below angels and below that human beings, that also was a form of kingship. So the cosmos was a king, a regime of kingship um, and also the human polity was a kingship, but even the animals were ordered according to sort of a monarchical uh, regime type. And so you had this notion that if you, in the middle ages, in the medieval period, you had this notion that if you rebelled against monarchy and kingship in your own society, you were doing nothing less than rebelling against God's very cosmic natural order itself. And so you were trying to topple, in a sense, both nature and God. I call this medieval monarchical fatalism. You can see that up on the screen on the left as a kind of predominant ideology, not the only ideology, but a predominant ideology of the medieval world and a sort of structuring uh, vision of reality. Now, one way to look at Thomas More, Erasmus, and Christian Renaissance humanists, or even humanists more generally, is that they reject this social imaginary, and they shift into something that scholars of the Renaissance call cosmopoesis. Now, it's important to see that there are atheistic branches of uh, Renaissance humanism. Think of someone like Machiavelli, who I'll return to in a moment, but there are also Christian humanists. For Christian humanists like Moore and Erasmus, who were very devout Catholics, obviously Moore ends up a canonized uh, saint within the church and a martyr within the church, the move to cosmopoesis was not a rejection of God's sovereignty. Instead, it was a shift. They thought it was a recovery of the patristics. Uh, Erasmus was very concerned with the recovery of the early primitive church and the, an anthropology of the Imago Dei. The Imago Dei is this notion that human beings are created in a, a image and likeness of God. And specifically Christian Renaissance humanists stress God's creative powers. God is creative and like an artist. And so human beings inside of his creation are also creative and like artists. The most famous depiction of this is uh, Michelangelo's fresco, which I have up on a later slide in the Sistine Chapel, the creation of Adam in which there's a kind of echo of creation between God and, and Adam as, as a kind of human creator. Cosmopoesis is the notion that human politics, this is a very epical shift that Moore and his friends make, that human politics is our business, like we create it. God does not just hand us our regimes. 
God doesn't just, uh, you know, dictate a regime of, of monarchy to us. In fact, monarchy is created by us. We, we erect it, we set it up, and we're responsible for it to some degree. Cosmopoiesis is this notion that poetics in the Renaissance is bigger than just limited to art artifacts or objects. The Renaissance is, of course, still astounding in its art. I mean, it's just mind blowing in its art. We probably don't have art that good. Maybe we do. But even if we have art that's that good, we don't do it that way anymore. We do something different. And it's important to see that for the Renaissance Christian humanists, art objects are not limited to things like paintings, uh, epic poems. They also include architecture, entire cities, and in fact, the whole regime you live in. So just like individual artists, the, the whole notion, Renaissance cult of the virtuoso, someone like Michelangelo or Raphael create particular art objects, entire collectivities create dwelling spaces, cosmopoesis, spaces of poetics in which we dwell. In other words, we dwell in sorts, in sorts of collective creations, world makings, and meanings. What you see on the right there is a detail of an unattributed um, 16th century, very famous uh, painting called the Ideal City of Urbino. This is uh, the whole notion that Renaissance has this breakthrough, urban planning, the whole notion that you could create a city um, that was a sort of idealized city that was better than the cities that, that human beings currently dwelled and lived within. Now, Moore's genius, I think my view of Moore is that he is more self-consciously doing individually and uh, with intention, something that human beings priorly only did collectively and unselfconsciously. He is world-making. He is creating an entire, in utopia, what he's doing is he's creating an entire place, culture, politics. And so he's doing self-consciously what up until that point, human beings only did unselfconsciously, half-consciously, and collectively. And Moore is a kind of uh, pivot figure in that he's the first person to do this. Where do we see this in Utopia as a text? Where do we see cosmopoesis? I'm going to pick two spots. Uh, the first spot is in Moore's willingness to imagine a totally different world. It's uh, well known that Moore is the forerunner to entire genres, science fiction, fantasy that we've talked about, people like Tolkien that we discussed last time. Moore is the forerunner to those people. He's the first person to sit down and self-consciously create cosmopoesis in a microcosmic scale in this manner. We can talk about the disanalogies, by the way, with Platonism uh, later, if you like. But he sits down and on purpose imagines, just in a kind of freewheeling way, an entire different world. Think about the way in which Moore is almost fascinated by his own abilities in the Imago Dei to be able to uh, imagine a geography. There's these great passages in the opening of book two of Utopia, you'll remember, where he uses these sort of uh, almost loving, tender descriptions of the geography, right? Like he says, oh, Utopia is an island and it's shaped like a crescent moon. Uh, but then a little later, he's using the language, the exactitude of a cartographer. He says it's, I forget exactly what it is, a hundred something or X, whatever the variable is, miles wide at its narrowest point. And so he he's, He's evoking uh, with great detail and also with poetics, a different a world, a world apart. What's going on there is he's showcasing his own cosmopoetic powers as a human being made in the image of God. So he's making the geography of utopia. Also brilliantly for Moore, the whole time it's a mashup between reality and fantasy in a way that is really mind bending. And scholars tell us that some naive readers of Moore actually were taken in by Utopia and thought that he, they didn't catch the irony and thought he was describing an actual place. Utopia is both within the map that would have been known to Moore and it's outside of it. It's an invented geography and yet somehow it's inside our geography. I mean, someone like Borges, who I admire tremendously, 
I mean, you're looking at the forerunner here. You're looking at, at the sort of fountainhead of that kind of mind bending thing we often uh, associate with postmodernism, the mashup of the real and the not real, the, the fantasy and, um, and the actual. So the, one place you see this is in the geography, but more also uh, showcases the cosmopoetic powers of the utopians themselves. So we get a great amount of detail about all kinds of things, um, language, culture, dress, food, when they get up in the morning, et cetera, et cetera. So we get all these habits that are really weird habits that the utopians themselves are, have created. The, the utopians themselves are involved in a kind of cosmopoetic world creation. I wanna just uh, point out very briefly that Moore is brilliant at something that later social science fiction authors or fantasy authors like Tolkien will pick up on, which is he's brilliant at the suggestive or elusive detail that makes you think he's got a lot more behind it than you can see. So for instance, he implies an entire history to Utopia. He tells us, oh, there's this, he just sort of offhandedly has Heifelidae say, Utopus, the founder did this and this and that. So suddenly you get the sense that you are, you've traveled to a world and very much like if you got on a plane and got out in a place that was foreign to you, say it was Caracas or it was um, Tokyo, you have the same, same sort of feeling when you're reading Thomas More's Utopia that you're getting these fragments and you sort of understand fragments of what's going on around you, but that there's a much deeper world going on there. And so that's one area of cosmopoiesis. More um, is, insists on this sort of totality of a microcosmic world that human beings dwell in that is different than his world. Second place to look, and I had you guys reread these passages for today, is the famous dialogue on council at the end of book one. That's the dialogue in which Peter Giles and Morris unsuccessfully try to persuade Heifelidae to enter into the council of monarchs in Europe. And Heifelidae is essentially like, no way I'm not doing that. Eric uh, talked to us about this in a really fascinating way. Um, what I wanna know, I have a sort of un unorthodox reading of this because the typical reading of the um, dialogue on council, you know, people like Quentin Skinner read the dialogue on council this way, is that it's a reprisal of um, the Ciceronian theme of decorum. So you'll remember that uh, there's a whole exchange that goes on in which they discuss how if you're in the council of kings, you have to judge the, the, the social theater that's going on around you correctly. You know, if, if a farce is going on, if a satire is going on, and you enter in like a tragedian and say something really serious, then you're going to get the whole scene wrong and you're going to mess up the politics of it. Or if a high tragedy is going on and you come in and make a fart joke, then again, you don't understand Ciceronian decorum. You don't understand how to judge what to say, when to say it, where to say it. Now, I think that's true in so far as it goes, but once again, I think more is far more original than simply recovering uh, something that Cicero said. I think that cosmopoesis is going on here. The dialogue on council is more reflecting on the notion that politics is actually theatrical, not in a metaphor, not in analogy, in fact, Politics is a theater. It's a staged set of meanings that we carry out. In other words, Moore's point in the dialogue on council, in my view, is ontological. He's saying that politics is performed. It's lived theater. Politics is literally a serious kind of play. Human beings are seriously at play in politics. By the way, Shakespeare, who was a great admirer of Thomas More, I think Shakespeare in his tetralogy, in his history plays, this notion of social ontology reaches a climax. I think you could read, I'm interested in reading Shakespeare's history plays as essentially Morian in their social ontology. Phrases that have become cliches in our culture, like all the world's a stage from as you like it, that's actually an ontological claim. The ontological claim is that all the world is cosmopoesis. Human beings are world creators and they dwell in the sort of theaters and stages that they create. So I have a different read on the dialogue of council as essentially an ontological 
set of reflections and not just the reflections on Ciceronian decorum. What's the upshot of all this? Uh, point one upshot of all this, and I'll go through the other three points much more briefly, is that for more, we are beings that dwell inescapably within imaginaries. So the imaginary is the real for humans. Humans imagine meanings, they perform meanings, and then they live in those meanings. And what this implies is uh, an explanation or a vision of why we are epic dwellers. Have you ever considered that other animals that are, don't dwell within culture, history, meanings, they don't have this problem of foreignness or alienness to one another. I'm not saying they get along, but a grizzly bear that runs into another grizzly bear more or less understands their form of life. But drop a human being spatially in another culture or temporally in another epoch, and we are completely lost. Like St. Augustine says, the surest sign of original sin is that a human being would rather spend time with their, a dog than a foreigner. We don't orient ourselves, we orient ourselves more easily to a dog than to a human being that is not within our world making cosmopoetic um, space. So, first thing to note is that we inescapably dwell in epics, and that's one of Moore's really profound insights is that you can go across the Atlantic, end up in this place, America, and everything they're doing will seem strange to you, and everything you're doing will seem strange to them. You will not understand one another. The other end of this is that history becomes open-ended, right? So history is a field of imagination and creative action for the Imago Dei. Human beings are given their freedom by God to pass through and create different worlds. We're kind of condemned, if you like, or given a gift, if you want to put it less negatively, it does have that ambivalence for Christian humanists to world making. We make the world. We make the social political world. We don't make all the world, but we make the social political world. And in contrast to Plato, we don't just cycle through regimes. For those who are familiar with Plato's uh, Republic, in Plato's Republic, there's an ahistorical conception of a fixed number of regimes. Thomas More is very modern in that he thinks that that's not the case. The field of history is blown wide open. New regime types can arrive. New kinds of politics can arrive. Um, it's also obviously clearly a critique of the medieval social imaginary. You don't have to have monarchy. Monarchy is not given to you by God. What's given to you by God is your imaginative creative powers. And so you can create monarchy and its set of meanings, or you can create something else. Second way in which utopia is a big breakthrough, this one uh, more briefly, is that I think utopia is a concept of new humanist authority. The humanists, and there you have Thomas More on the far left, Erasmus in the center, and Peter Giles on the right. The humanists were masters of the art of interpretation. If you want to understand the humanist revolution, which was in some ways as big as the Reformation and came right before it, but it's been sort of covered over by the Reformation, so we don't see just how huge it was. In some ways, it fed the Reformation because Erasmus went back to sort of the original, he thought he was going back anyway, to the original Greek in the Bible and to the original sort of cultural world or epoch as a criticism of existing as an act of reform, Erasmus was a Catholic, but as an act of reform of the current church. Now, if you wanna ask yourself why the humanists were a kind of cultural revolution that really shook Europe, one way at that is that scholars tell us that the humanists were a new lettered class. They were a new class of educated people. Thomas More was not a noble or an aristocrat. He was the son of a lawyer and he was a lawyer himself. And yet he went to the very highest echelons of power. The respect for humanists came out of the fact that they basically supplanted and destroyed the authority of scholastics who were the major authorities in the medieval universities. How did they do this? The scholastics had very ornate, complex, often very beautiful systems of thought, but they were premised on ancient authorities. So their first move, if you read someone like Thomas Aquinas, is to grab a sort of 
atomistic piece of the Bible or of Aristotle and then say, this authority says X, I say Y, but he often reasons from the premise. The humanists were able to go back with their historical awareness, with this cultural awareness they had, with their um, virtuoso ability to read Greek and Latin, they were able to go back and say, your first premise is wrong. And they basically upended all, it seemed very humble. Oh, here we are, we're just looking at texts where these erudite um, kind of uh, scholars often our little contemplative corner, but what they were doing was extremely, extremely um, unsettling to the medieval world because in areas from medicine to theology, to law, to philosophy, they would go to the first premise of the scholastics and say, you have that wrong. You're not in their epic. It's a commonplace in Renaissance literature to note that people like Petrarch, who's thought to start the Renaissance, were some of the first people to have historical awareness. By the way, a place where I think that the humanists, for all their admiration of the Greeks and the Romans, they're more like us in that they're intensely historically aware. So what I want to do with this is I want to expand the notion, once you see that of, of humanist authority, once you see that the humanists were authorities on texts, but then you put that together with the notion that they think that the world itself is a set of cosmopoetic meanings, whoa, then something really interesting happens, which is the humanists are saying they're the authorities on reading political reality. They are the rational epistemic authority on politics. If you want to understand politics, you need a humanist, which is what got more killed, by the way, because he gets involved in the court of Henry VIII. And um, he, yeah, gets entangled in all kinds of theological controversies, and eventually he gets beheaded by Henry VIII. But what I want you to see is that they thought of themselves as new authorities in the reading of cosmopoetic worlds. They thought that they had analogical reasoning that other people didn't have. So for instance, they could draw on a vast knowledge of ancient history and different circumstances to give you analogies. Oh, uh, you know, you're fighting a war, Henry VIII? Well, let me tell you about something that happened within Roman history or Greek history that has an echo of meanings that might help you sort through your meanings. So that's a kind of analogical thinking. But they also thought of themselves as masters of counterfactual thinking, hypothetical um, what-if situations. In fact, all of utopia is an exercise in counterfactual thinking, right? Where more just imagines a world that's not the case. So they think that their historicity, their dominance of language, make them masters of interpretation, not just of texts, but of the cosmopoetic realities that we live and perform as theater. And they, and they are sort of travelers in thought and imagination. Haifla Day is a kind of paradigmatic humanist because he's this wizened traveler that you look at and you wonder, how did you get to know as much as, the, as you know? And his answer is, I've traveled in thought, in books, into ancient, texts and places, and I've traveled in space to the new world, to alien places that you don't really understand. Last two points. And then I hope we have some time to discuss and all this, all this stuff that I'm talking about. Um, I think there's a critical branch to this new authority, a utopia as critique. I think that one of the things that the current scholarship misses because it's so focused on the sort of doctrinal controversy over property and money and things like that is that utopia is not foremost wedded to any doctrinal question about the economy. What it is wedded to is a critique of all political realisms and fatalisms. For more, utopian imagination is more realistic than all realisms. Utopian imagination is more realistic than all realisms insofar as it grasps the contingency of meanings and practices we live. The mistake of realism is to miss the fact that the meanings we live are contingent on our creative agency, collectively granted, not any one of us can change them, but collectively we could change the entire cosmopoetic epic or world or era. If I alone try to change it, it's like Don Quixote. But if people collectively change it, suddenly you're in a completely different world, right? You li you're living in a completely different time and place. So 
this is what I mean by contingency, is that meanings are one way, but they could be another way. And the mistake of realism is to treat one set of contingent meanings as though it's faded and inescapable. In other words, realism, this is me um, expanding on more, is an attempt to fix one social imaginary and in so doing is a repressed utopia. All realists are utopians who lack self-knowledge. They are people who don't realize that what they call the real and the inescapable only way of having the social world is a set of social imaginaries that they created together at one time and at one place. N note the ferocity that a lot of the radical scholars um, draw our attention to in book one of Heithleday's criticism of everything going on in Europe at that time. The enclosure movement, the, the enclosure movement that's the advent of sort of modern capitalist society against the medieval one, um, the hanging of thieves, the militarism of the court of Henry VIII and the other monarchs of Europe. All of these are not viewed as realisms by Heithleday. He says, I've been to another world where people don't have these ways of organizing. They don't have this private property. They don't have the enclosure movement. They don't hang their thieves. They don't, they, so they don't have the death penalty if you rob something. They don't have militarism. So these things are contingent. This links up to Erasmus's notion of a collective or communal form of sin, which he calls folly. We inherit folly and we often try to fix or make inescapable our folly. We say our folly, our collective customs, which God laughs at, which Erasmus laughs at, are the only way to do things. That's the only way to have a society. So there is no anthropological minimum for more. Why? Because human beings are cultural creative animals. And so their politics only are completed through the medium of history and culture. And Mac, people like his contemporary, like Machiavelli, who's often thought to be the founder of, of modern realism, their attempt to find a politics that's an anthropological minimum, like if you've read The Prince, all politics is about power and fortuna and virtu, is actually just the attempt to fix one culture around politics and say it's the only realistic way to do something. So there's entire theatrics of power in Machiavelli. Think of the spectacle of an execution as in, in a Machiavellian tenor as a way of sort of enacting one set of theater or meanings. In other words, one cosmopoesis. So in light of all this and uh, Ending on this note, I want to return to the debate between the conservative and the radical scholars. I actually think both sides are partially right, which is the nice way of saying both sides are partially wrong. But when you write it down, I recommend this, by the way, to junior fellows, when you're writing the essay, say they're partially right always, as opposed to they're partially wrong. Um, I think they're par both partially right. Uh, what the radicals get right about more is the intensity of criticism of his thought, his awareness that all of it is contingent. Um, what's that famous statement by Rousseau that to uh, reason from the actual to the possible seems like pretty good logic to me? Because of course, what realists always say is, you can't have a society without private property. If you did, the whole thing would just go to pot. But then in fact, you can travel to worlds where they do not have private property. Human beings have lived entire cosmopoetic worlds. Now, maybe we don't want to live in that world, but just as a mere anthropological fact, there have been societies and there are even milieus and subcultures within our own society where there is not private property. So the radicals are right to see that what Moore is stressing is not so much a commitment to um, platonic communism as to the radical changeability of society, the possibility of totality, of a shift in totality to a different epoch and to a different paradigm. However, the conservatives are right to see that Moore is not actually wedded to any one of his doctrines. He is playing with the different doctrines. He is ambivalent about them. 
he is thinking through what it would it be like to have this set of meanings versus that set of meanings. He didn't just write a monological tract. He didn't write the Communist Manifesto. He wrote a very complicated, playful, satirical, ironic, biting dialogue in which there are so many voices at play that it's hard to find a single authorial voice where you say, this is what, what Moore thinks about the institutions, practices, and beliefs that ought to reign within society. So I think that Moore is a radical, but not a radical in the sense that Eric was arguing that he's a radical, that he's absolutely committed to platonic communism. I think he's a radical insofar as he's made this shift, this epic making shift toward the insight that political society is contingent and that you can play with it and make it different. And so his real um, antagonists are realists and fatalists. Now, as a Christian humanist, what is he playing in light of? What's his standard or measure? I think his standard or measure is the Imago Dei. And so I have this image up of the fresco of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, which if you ever see it in Rome, oh, it just makes you want to weep. You just look up. Of course, you're surrounded by hundreds of people. So you hold back the tears, but there it is. It's just spectacular. And um, that's an image of the Imago Dei. Even at the meta level, Michelangelo is outside of that as a further echo of the Imago Dei and his absolutely genius creative capacities. Now, here's the way I think of Moore's radicalism. He thinks the problem is always, how do I imagine a world, a set of meanings, practices, and beliefs that are worthy of human beings as made in the image of God? How do I imagine a world that is worthy of, of human beings as made in the image of God? And so this is my fourth conceptual point, which is utopia as a form of serious play. Uh, I said on the last slide there, however, Moore is chastened by his Augustinianism. So conservatives are right to pick up on the notion that Moore thinks that we're always going to be entangled in sin. This makes him very different than modern radicals. He doesn't think you cross the line of the revolution and everything is fine. I'm sort of caricaturing Marx, but you know, he doesn't think there's this point where you just escape the human conditions and our limits and failures. So here's the paradox. You have to have a chastened pride in a kind of Augustinian sense at the same time that it's a demand on you by the gospels to keep imagining new kingdoms. Father Greg Boyle, who I think is a living saint amidst us in Los Angeles, I tend to think of him in that way. He might not like that, but I tend to think of him as someone who's willing to imagine new forms of kinship, as he likes to call them, new forms of being in community that are worthy of the gospels. Oh, you thought you had to relate to homeboys and criminals in this way? No, you can relate to them in this way. You could give them a job no matter what. So long as they want the job, here's the job not supply demand logic of capitalist markets. Here's the job. Now we'll see what happens. Um, so here, you're, you, there's a chastened pride and that chastened pride is nonetheless has the demands of the kingdom of the gospel on earth as it is in heaven in Jesus's famous prayer on earth as it is in heaven as a demand right now. By the way, pride being humbled goes in both directions which sometimes I think the conservatives don't see. It also means don't pridefully um, divinize one particular cosmopoetic world as the only cosmopoetic world. Don't say the thing you built was exactly what God wanted you to build. That market, that economy, that set of political institutions. From the perspective of monarchical um, fatalism, our world looks like a total utopia and vice versa. A medieval peasant could not possibly imagine what we live and we look at what they live and think, how is that at all possible? So I wanna end with this thought, and I think there's a lot of to discuss here, that what you're reading in Moore, when you read all his proposals in Utopia, and there's so many, are him playing a chastened play, a serious play with what it would look like to make a home adequate to the Imago Dei and, and what it wouldn't look like. So there's a kind of negative political theology there too. Like what, should, what ought we not to do to make it look more like the kingdom? And then what ought we to do? So there's this negative side, this critical side to utopia and this positive side. Uh, very briefly, I just wanna uh, put these in terms of the, the uh, traditional three transcendentals that come out of Neoplatonism because Moore was something of a Platonist even though I've drawn some contrasts here. I think someone like Eric Nelson shows that to be the case. I think one thing you can think when you're reading uh, Utopia is that 
the different policy proposals are being organized under the true, the beautiful, the good, the three um, Neoplatonic transcendentals. So at least it's a useful heuristic maybe. Um, so think of something like the true. We hear that utopians get free education. There's a certain freedom of conscience that the utopians enjoy vis-a-vis uh, -vis religion. It's not our liberal notion of freedom of conscience, but by medieval standards, it's tremendous freedom of conscience that they're allowed. The beautiful uh, utopian society has walkability, right? You have to be, you can walk from town to town. There are 54 little cities and you can walk to them. There's a great emphasis on gardening and on a mixture of the rural and the urban, what's beautiful of the, about the rural, what's beautiful about the urban without going to the extreme of the negation of the urban nor the negation of the rural. So the rural has to exist within the urban. Why? Because we're made in the image of God. And so something worthy of us would be beautiful. We, at theosis, we become like God through Christ. We become brothers uh, and sisters to Christ and theosis. We divinize in a certain sense. What would it look like if our society were divinized? It would be at the scale of the human as something divine, walkable, gardens, beauty, the true. They're good elements, the good elements. Um, we would have a say in what our society looks like. More sets up the institutions of utopia to have democratic elements. It's not modern democracy, but there is a representative system and, uh, and deliberation and so on. There's free medical care. The hospitals are beautiful, by the way. They lavishly spend on the hospitals. I sometimes think about this when I go around Los Angeles. Imagine if the hospital was the most beautiful place in the city so that the sick and the, the, those who were trying to convalesce and those who were dying got to see beauty. My grandfather refused to go to the hospital and died of a heart attack at home. He preferred it to being in a hospital. Why? Because he's made in the Imago Dei and he did not want to be in an ugly hospital. He did not want to die in an ugly hospital. I'm not saying don't go to the hospital. I would go. But people sense that modern hospitals are not worthy of their dignity. At least my grandfather did. Um, there's an economy of care, a humanized economy, craft, leisure is a big feature. You could see those as elements of the good. So you could look at these three transcendentals as more playing with cosmopoesis to ask himself, what would it look like for humans to attain a kind of shared um, sanctity in Christ? What would their communities look like if there were a sanctity that pervaded their communities? I wanna say a last word here, uh, which is, and I'll conclude on this, and I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on, on any, anything that came up during the talk or other thoughts you have from your own reading. But uh, I'm really struck when people say, there's no way I would want to live in Thomas More's utopia. Because I tend to think, where are you located socially in our society? Hmm, you must have health care. You must have beauty. You must have walkability. You must have access to education. You must feel like you're not bullied in your freedom of conscience. If you see nothing inspiring in utopia, it's probably because you already made an exclusive little utopia for yourself in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and didn't let anyone else inside of it. That's a polemic. Apologies, I'm sort of a polemical person. But my question for you is always, if you, don't find, if, if you find realism more attractive than imagination, is that perhaps because you already dwell within something that is more worthy of the Imago Dei? I think that would be... Uh, Erasmus's, Peter Giles, and Thomas More's challenge to us. I will leave it there. Thank you very much, Jason, for that really rich presentation. I, I join in all the virtual yellow applause hands. Uh, a great way into more, a great way to think through a lot of the issues we've been discussing over the course of the whole seminar. So our gratitude for that. Um, we have a good 30 minutes for a discussion and we have our, our texts starting on page 33, I think it was, uh, with the sections that Jason was really thinking through and offering us a way to approach. Um, and so let's open the floor for discussion and um, I'll, I'll just acknowledge people in the order of yellow hands raised. Do we have any first takers? Stefano, please. Thank you, Jason. It was super interesting. I'll, uh, I don't want to take uh, too much time just to leave it for the other students <laughs> to ask. 
I have two questions. One is about Machiavelli, and, and I think you hinted at some point that this idea of the, the kind of theatrics of politics, it's, some, it's something that more has in common with Machiavelli. Um, and Machiavelli is also an, an author of, of, of plays, among other things, right? He write, he write the, the prince, but then he writes his plays, where this, this, this character who's like, is, like, is doing the politics in, in a sense. Like. And so my question is, where does this come from? I mean, maybe more doesn't take it directly from, from um, Machiavelli, because he may not have been aware of his work. Do they both take it, take it from some, some reading of ancient theater? I mean, I was struck by the, the part where he, he cites uh, Seneca's Octavia, which is kind of a play where you have, and it's, it's full of political meaning, kind of, political instruction embedded in the play. Uh, this is kind of a more, more, my more general question, however, is um, um, when you started by saying, oh, this is all new, right? Uh, and then I, I, I mean, this is something that didn't happen before. And then my immediate question was, well, what about, what about uh, the myth of, myth of Atlantis in Plato, right? In terms of the cosmopoiesis and so on and so forth. So, but I think what you were trying to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that this is moving away from a certain medieval tradition, right? Um, Rather yeah, than it's dangerous to say in front of a classicist that this is new because the classicist, <laughs> as as our great Stefano can always point out to you, uh, uh that's not new. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes. Okay, right. so I want to I want to make the philosophical claim. I'll work backwards to the second question if I don't get to it, remind me. I, I want to make the philosophical claim that in Plato, uh, there is uh, a sort of ontologizing of particular meanings or regime types into the cosmos. So even though you can, of course, pick up strands of Plato where you say, look, it's, it's more like more. I think that what really is different philosophically between Pla Platon Platonism in its original form and Thomas More's form of Platonism is that he doesn't ontologize a particular set of regime types around a polis. So like in the Republic, you're kind of trapped in a cycle of history where there are only certain kinds of political meanings that can happen mm -hmm. and they come around sort of like on a wheel. Um, and I think that for Thomas More, uh, new genre types can, can sort of burst on the scene, just like there was no such thing as uh, say a film in the ancient world. Now, are there family resemblances? You could do the same move on me. Yeah, but film is based on theater, but there's something new about film. And there's what I'm trying to say here is yeah, there are family resemblances between Plato's notion of even, even in the Republic where he says, I will make a city in speech. You know, you could say, hey, that's more. He picks up on city of speech. He radicalizes it. But the big difference, and here I think I, this is going to sound bad. I actually agree with Nietzsche's critique of Plato. I'm something of a weird Platonist, but I actually think Nietzsche was right about this, where he says that what happened to Plato was he, he in some sense, discovered the concept. He discovered in intellectual history the notion of a concept, and he was so impressed with the notion of a concept or an idea that he ontologized it. He said, like, there are ideas out there somehow, mm -hmm. like the yeah. idea of the truth. Now, of course, Kallipolis in the Republic is not a form. It participates in the transcendentals I was discussing earlier. Nonetheless, I think that there is not um, the we we are um, inheritors of more and the humanists historicity in a way that Plato is not. Plato does not have a, as radical a notion of the open-endedness of possible meanings because he thinks that the interplay between the forms and the regimes is tighter. It's more deterministic. What do you think about that, Stefano? No, no, I, I understand it better now because what, what I wanted to go from there was also ask you the question about, because I was really uh, struck by this idea of the cosmopoiesis and the you know the human being as creator imago dei and so on and so forth and i, I was wondering whether uh, i mean as opposed to these medieval ideas whereby you know there's this divine order and that's reproduced by humans and they stick to it right they don't have this creative freedom and i was wondering whether there's an uh in more there is a an awareness of the risks of this uh, that the man becomes this kind of titanic figure and the dream becomes a nightmare. And because yeah, this, and this, this, this free creativity, you know, gives, gives way to monstrosities, right? Yes. Um, there certainly be anachronistic to say that he has any kind of awareness of something like totalitarianism the way we do. 
but I think he's an Aug he was enough, he lectured on Augustine and he was enough of an Augustinian to recognize that um, even our imaginings are still touched by folly, which is why this is something I just absolutely love about Moore. He satirizes himself. He's ironic about himself. So this is what I was trying to capture with serious play is that the paradox of human beings is we must do better. And yet we must know that even when we try to do better, we'll still have to say sorry, to put it kind of tritely. Like we can't just stop in the middle of the journey historically, um, but we also have to uh, recognize that even our play is not gonna exit the Augustinian situation. So I think that he has a healthier radicalism than modern radicals because he's aware of original sin and he's aware of the need to humble pride. And I would say to a lot of my radical friends that their pride has not been humbled. And so they tend to think you cross the line of revolution and then all the woke people, I'm not one to always slam wokeism, by the way. I know that's become like a favorite sport of people online, but then you, then all the woke people, everything is fine. You don't end up with the guillotine. You don't end up with the gulags and so on. I think that's a big mm -hmm. mistake. Um, now, in terms of Moore and Machiavelli, I think that that's another way to look at it, though, is that Moore is also intensely aware of the danger of realism. Machiavelli was aware of Moore, is my understanding from the scholarship. Uh, I'm not a Renaissance scholar. I'm just a political philosopher. So I go back and plunder this stuff for my own purposes. But um, my understanding is that Machiavelli was aware of Moore, but not vice versa. The Prince wasn't published, I believe, until posthumously. So it was published almost around the same year as Utopia, curiously. It was a little bit after. And in The Prince, he says, I will not discuss any fantasies, any, and he's clearly taking a shot at Plato, but some people think he's also aware of Thomas More and that he's sort of saying like, there's no purpose in thinking of utopias. And uh, so More didn't have the benefit of being able to reply to Machiavelli because he was not aware of The Prince and was not able to read it. But I, I'm sort of supplying a reply philosophically, which is your realism is also a theater. Did they both get that from Seneca to go back to your first question? Yeah, probably because Seneca is filled with that metaphor that Shakespeare also likes. But there again, I wanna press, I don't know the Roman world as well as the Greek world, but I would wanna press on the sort of um, the newness of the, at least it may be just a question of degree and not entirely of classification of the awareness of history and the ability to change meanings. Were the Romans as aware of that? Um, Polybius certainly wasn't. Uh, he had this cyclical notion of regimes that no modern historian would sign up to. Um, but I don't know the Roman world well enough and the great Roman historians well enough in their background philosophy to, to say for sure. But so I think like the humanists, even if we try to do the exact same thing, Borges has that famous short story, Pierre Menard, the author of the Quixote, where this guy just sits down and rewrites the Quixote. And then, but it's a totally different novel because he writes it in the 20th century. So he writes it word for word. And then the commentator in the story keeps saying, these are so different from each other. So I think that, and this might just show how historicist I am. I think that even if we try to do the exact same thing now that Seneca does, we do it differently mm -hmm. because our cosmopoetic world and context and cultural situation is different. Should I handle the questions, David, or you? you um, yeah. Yes, David. Father Luke, go ahead. Um, just an observation, uh, and thank you again for your uh, emphasis on the uh, the idea of the restoration of the Imago Dei as part of uh, part of Moore's utopian vision. We've commented in the past on the many monastic elements that are present in uh, the kind of ethos that he's speculating on, or um, or maybe borrowing from. That is definitely one of them, especially in the early monastic sources. And Peter Brown has strongly emphasized this in the body and society, uh, the notion of sexuality in, in late antiquity, the restoration of the Imago Dei and having a unique community or society in which that could deliberately happen through particular forms of ascetical practice was very much characteristic of at least early monasticism. I don't think it had disappeared completely in terms of the mindset of, of the medieval tradition, but there were different notions notions of why you engaged in asceticism at that point. But again, thank you for mentioning that. Thank you, Father Luke. I appreciate that addition because it also gives me an opportunity. I didn't feel happy with my response to Stefano's second question. There's no adequate way to respond. Stefano's making some great points and um, it would be like a whole nother, you know, day of thought to, to go through them. But um, 
one of the things that differentiates Thomas More so radically from Machiavelli, who was put on the index by the Vatican of things not to read uh, when The Prince was published, is that his anthropology, right? So they both made the shift over into cosmopoesis, but Machiavelli has made it in an atheist vein and through an atheist um, anthropology where all there is is a play of impersonal forces. And he famously thinks of human beings, this is so telling by the way, as first he says, you need to be like a fox. No, you need to be like a lion. No, you need to be like a lion fox. No, human beings are the most dangerous animal of all because they can be like any animal they want. So Machiavelli intentionally bestializes humans. More, to your point about danger, Stefano, more would, I think, would always say there is um, a limit on power, a limit on our imaginings by what's worthy of the Imago Dei, that the goal is to um, sanctify human life and its participation within divine life. By the way, this is also what makes more far more egalitarian than Plato. More has a much more open end. Why? I think that's Christian theology, to be honest with you, or at least a certain understanding of it, that is much less hierarchical, hierarchicalized than Plato. For Plato, it looks pretty sweet to be the guardians, putting the laws aside, by the way, the laws is much more egalitarian, but in the Republic, it looks pretty, actually doesn't look that sweet to be the guardians to take that back. It's very militaristic. By the way, is anti-militarism also probably Christian in origin, um, or his skepticism of violence and the use of force, right? So I think that there are limits on power in more that have to do with the Imago Dei that do not exist in Machiavelli, where power is just sort of unbridled. And so you get this notion, these get this rival strain of humanist Renaissance thought where there's a real question of, are there any limits on power for Machiavelli's prince? Any limits at all, other than just the efficacy of the maintenance of power and the state? Anne Marie. Hey, um, I just want to say first thanks for your talk because it um, brought up a lot of things for me and I think I need to visit more a little bit in my own personal research. Um, but uh, when you were talking about more and like his world creating, I was wondering about um, characterizing him in a particular way and if he would characterize himself this way. Um, there is kind of like this characterization of this image of an architect in the ancient world who is someone who um, gets talked about as a person who can construct societies because they construct the buildings that society happens in. Um, and then eventually this metaphor flips and um, people who create worlds like virtual worlds or create worlds the way that more is creating worlds get talked about um, like architects. Um, so like they're creating something physical when they're actually creating, you know, this new mental society. And I um, was just curious, do you know if Moore talks about himself that way, if he uses this analogy of the architect, or if anyone writing about Moore talks about himself this way? I don't know. Um, you know, Moore's writings are voluminous. He was a, he, he was quite unique kind of figure in the history of thought. We have a few of them, um, but in that he was involved in politics. He was, a lot of political theorists are like me. They're just sort of, you know, um, often a monastic type corner, which is what the university is. But Moore was, um, I mean, he reached chancellor of England. So, um, but despite that fact, he had an enormous output of letters, other devotional works. I'm not a Morian scholar. I have other reasons for going back to him. I have read a, a lot of his work, but uh, I wouldn't be able to state whether or not he, he touches on that theme in, in particular. I do think we can see from the text we have in front of us that he's very interested in customs of architecture, um, customs of fashion and so on, because he describes them, right? In Utopia, he, in fact, uh, the 54 cities are maybe even suffocatingly planned to uh, give, give the due to the people who find Utopia sort of suffocating. Um, and and the, the, the placement of the common halls where people meet and everything. So clearly there is the notion of kind of ar architectonic and urban design um, that's on his mind. Uh, but I don't know if he specifically picks up on that. Which ancient sources do that? That's fascinating, by the way, Anne-Marie. Um, Vitruvius is the first one I've seen to do it. He talks about Alexander's the great architect, um, the one who designed Alexandria as uh, one of the people who can do this. And then um, there are also references to the guys who designed the Domus Aurea as like uh, magicians and world creators and kind of um, taking the chaos and turning it into structure and such. Yeah. Uh, ben, these are great questions. 
Actually, I, I have another thought on that that I just want to bring to the conversation that's unrelated to my other question. But um, in Utopia, more talks about how every like seven or 10 years or so, they have to move them around in the various houses, um, which is the idea of an architectural basis of reality. I don't know, it's, 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 it, it's, it's both, we think of our architectural as like architecture as creating static buildings, but in Moore's Utopia, buildings are themselves not static. Um, and like they move through the countryside a lot. So the actual space that they live in is less static than I think. Um, but my question was more about, um, you mentioned that Moore was anti-militaristic, but yet his, he bases his reality on a colonial society. Um, ex and explicitly one thing that struck me when I was reading it again was the, the, the cutting of the ditch and how that is both something that, that Utopus has his own people do as well as the native people, and yet they still have slaves. And there's just kind of back and forth of hierarchy that throughout the entire piece, like in some ways more can see a new world in some ways he just simply cannot. And I, I wonder how you, do you think that is an intentional part of Moore's philosophy or a blind spot? I think that uh, part of the reason I like to shift into seeing Moore as a interpretive and, and sort of ontological thinker, as opposed to a, uh, a thinker who's doctrinally tied to any one of his forms of serious play is because we're all the children of Moore at that point, because then we say, you know what, you're not thinking playfully enough. I don't like the, I don't think your form of society really meets the standards of um, of human reality in some way, of human desire, human dignity, or whatever it is that we think is missing. So I think that uh, Moore's impact has been so enormous that uh, we tend to think in Moorean terms oftentimes. I'm not saying Moore is inescapable, but oftentimes when I teach Moore in my political theology course, I find that people are basically deploying Moore against Moore. But if you, so if you read him ontologically, you're making his move, which is that's one set of contingent meanings. I don't think, and, and, and maybe you thought they were natural, for instance, all male leadership in the households, things like that. Um, certainly, uh, I don't want to live in a household where I, I'm the only one who has a say. I learned a, a ton from my wife. Like I follow her a lot of the time, but in Moore's households, it's, um, in fact, things are a lot better when I just follow my wife. Um, but, uh, but in Moore's households, it's like, you know, just by dint of biological birth, he's a lot more gender egalitarian than anything around him. Um, so uh, to be fair to him, like he's way out on, on a limb. I mean, the, the women are educated in the liberal arts. He taught his daughter um, in the liberal arts, Latin and things like that, which was highly strange, eccentric, even sort of um, wrong thing to do at the time. But obviously he thought it was folly in the Erasmian sense. I love your point though, Ben, the first one about the rotation of houses, because just think about that for a second. I'm not saying, think if we had different policies, like death rotates us houses, you know, God makes us rotate houses. We have a very overweening notion of we own things. I just signed a mortgage for the first time two years ago. And so I've been a renter most of my life. And so I'm like kind of hyper aware that I'm already 40. And so in a way I'm just renting this for longer and in a way that's economically more advantageous than people have to rent their whole lives because our society is built in such a way that ownership is rewarded and those that have get more and those that don't have get less. But imagine if the arrangement of society, like if I don't think Beverly Hills would look the way it does and Boyle Heights where Father Greg Boyle was working out of would look the way it does if you had to actually rotate houses. Now I'm not saying let's rotate houses, but maybe there would be something healthy in Beverly Hills with its gardens, so utopian, so utopian, and then uh, Boyle Heights in a tangle of interstates and pollution. Really? I mean, one of the reasons we swing around from the uh, 405 to the 10 so far, I have an L uh, LA native friend who tells me that's because uh, Beverly Hills successfully blocked an interstate plan that was supposed to go along there where there's Melrose and where there's Hollywood and so on, but those people didn't want the interstate there. So all of us now drive like this big old uh, you know, loop. Now, why do we do that? Because the perspective of people who live in a certain space dominates over those who are forced to live in another space. And um, maybe the solution isn't you know, something clunky like uh, the state plans where you live. I don't know that I'd like that, 
but maybe there would be ways of being more playful and egalitarian about how we think of things like um, zone in zoning, for instance, could we zone cities so that they're mandatory parks? Uh, could we zone cities so that roads are more equally shared and so on? Um, so I just love that observation, uh, Ben. We've got about uh, 10 minutes or so. Let's hear our questions with apologies to Professor Ken from our junior fellows. If uh, maybe I'll just hear from, from Victor and then Andy directly, and then we'll let Jason have a time to follow up and then we'll take it from there. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I I think I bring this up constantly and I, I don't want to look pessimistic, but I, I tend to be cautious about utopian ideas because I perceive that in, in these communities that people imagine, um, virtues tend to become the regime, right? So, and not just any kind of, of virtue, but specifically the kind of virtues that not even the church requires for, for holiness uh, that are cat categorized as uh, evangelical consoles like obedience and uh, austerity, detachment of, of uh, material goods. And my concern is that when virtues become a regime, they are no longer virtue, virtues because people don't choose to leave them. People is demanded to, 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 to attach them to them. And I think Tolkien was conscious of this because his utopian communities in the Lord of the Rings are uh, within those kind of races or, or groups that are virtues in themselves, like inherently virtues like the, the elves um, and the hobbits that are so nature attached and um, like in the, in disinterested in economic issues. So that, that's my main concern. And that's where I think that um, policy has to be more realistic. It's better for everyone when policy is realistic than uh, rather than utopian. Thank you, Victor. Andy, could you go ahead with your question? Yeah, my question kind of revolved around the reading when I read it the second time. Um, I was thinking what your thoughts were on, like, does more advocate being in the Council of Kings? Because I, I know he, he himself was in the Council of Kings and that's how he died. The, the, is, does he see that as an effective way of affecting the, what you call the cosmopoesis? Um, or was he like kind of being a realist and just like playing his part um, in the play? What do you think, Andy? By the way, good to see you this morning. Missed seeing you this year. <laughs> I have no idea. That's why I asked you. <laughs> I mean, it's a, here. I think that the what I've grouped together is the conservative scholarship is um, right to see the sort of complexity and polyvocal nature of of Moore's dialogue, I think that he felt um, conflicted over it. And what you're seeing is an internal argument that he himself has over whether or not one ought to take the Heithla Day route and um, live a contemplative life or the Vita Activa. And this is a, this I do think is a repetition of an ancient um, set of distinctions. Should one take the Vita, vita Activa or the Vita contem Contemplativa? And I think he felt very, very torn about that. And I think it's an unresolved problem within humanism. Uh, you know, humanism failed as a political program. It, it, it rose meteorically and, and changed society, but then it fell in part because Reformation theologies replaced it in which the theology wasn't the Imago Dei. Uh, look at someone like Luther who says, you're not made in the Imago Dei. All your desires are suspect, sinful. All politics is equally bad, et cetera, et cetera. Um, did you take the political theology course with me, Andy? Yeah. You did. So we read, in some ways, I think Calvin and Luther and different theologies of the Reformation that are not Imago Dei humanistic theologies uh, supplant that. And a lot of our modern ideologies are actually premised on that, that you're inescapably self-interested, say, comes out in some ways, I think, is a secularization. Hobbes is a secularization in some sense of Luther in that regard, that uh, life is nasty, brutish, and short. You can't imagine someone with the joy of life of Erasmus or more saying they saw the dark side, but you can't imagine them saying life is nasty, brutish and short and that's it. So let's organize a Leviathan to keep us all more or less, you know, on good behavior until we die. Um, so, but I think it was unresolved, sorry to go off there um, because the humanist project um, 
was supplanted by different political theologies and other ideologies. And so Moore's program for changing Europe through the Council of Kings didn't work, right? Um, it, it failed on a personal level, it failed on a collective level. That's probably a good way to circle back to, to Victor's point. I mean, one thing I really want you guys to see, whether you agree with me or not, is that on my reading, utopia as ontology is inescapable. So the dichotomy realism, um, utopianism is a false dichotomy. We live, we already live a set of imagined meanings. Imagine going back in a time machine to a medieval peasant and explaining what we live today. I mean, for them, if you had toppled the king, since they believed in a sort of monarchical fatalism, the whole universe would have gone to pot. There would have been earthquakes and, you know, all kinds of signs and wonders that you had basically gone against the divinely, um, the divinely set order. And so if you see, that's, that was my first claim is that utopia is a social ontology. In other words, it's a descriptive issue first and foremost. It's not foremost a form of idealization. I think that's a misreading of more. I think we continue to read more as utopia is just idealization, which was point four. But I think there are, it's a complex concept. It's partly a descriptive claim that we are dwellers in the imaginary, in social imaginaries, right? And then, um, so the real danger is our realisms, we don't realize are contingent and we made them that way. So I guess part of my reply to you, Victor, would be, and this is just this, again, I appreciate you pushing because I think that it's a very important point. And I think most people would share your intuitions, but here I'm kind of like the crazy Erasmian saying, our customs are folly. A lot of our customs are not inescapable. They're actually folly. And I, this is this I would submit to you, and I think people are very receptive to this at this moment. Our realisms have failed us. Our realisms are not realistic. Look at ecology, look at economy. Our realisms are destroying our societies. So like Pope Francis says, let us dream. It's time to um, participate in different kinds of imaginaries. Now your point about virtue education, I hear some liberalism there. Liberalism is the view, you know, in, in, in the broad sense of the history of political thought that, you know, uh, the good can be separated from the right and you can have a set of rights and then people can pick their own virtues or whether they have virtues at all. I don't, I don't um, subscribe to that political theory. I think virtue education is inescapable in society as a set of character traits. So what happens in societies where you, where you don't inculcate or educate virtue, Though I would agree with you that I don't want to inculcate, inculcate all virtues, and I certainly don't want to inculcate a perfectionism of virtue. I don't want the state involved in that. So I sort of share your skepticism. Um, but the, the thing is that virtue is, is a non-optional for human beings. They have to embody certain character traits. And so what happens in societies that um, don't inculcate virtues self-consciously, like liberal societies, is that we end up with certain virtues, like say tolerance that we need, we need those virtues. And yet we're very bad at inculcating them because we think we're imposing on people when we try to teach them tolerance. And so right now the far authoritarian right can always point and tell liberals, you're being hypocritical. You say you're open-minded, but you're not open-minded to my intolerance. And you're trying to force your virtue of tolerance on me. So you're intolerant about tolerance. And so there's a real blind spot within liberal political theory where it is failing to generate the virtues that sustain um, its form of political life. We got two minutes left, that was too long. I don't pretend I've answered Victor's question. That's a great question, Victor. So keep, keep, keep that, keep pressing on that. Maybe I could rephrase Victor's question, which I share um, in a different way that I was gonna come at it. And then maybe we'll just leave that hanging and we can carry it into our next conversation because there probably is some overlap as well. And I'll take a moment just to welcome, we'll do a better introduction in a moment, but Father Gregory Boyle, who's now with us in the, the, the Zoom matrix, at least in my lower left. So welcome, Father Greg, we're very glad you can join us. Um, what if we thought of Victor's question about practices of virtue? And I note the proximity, as you noted, Jason, at the beginning of the, I, when I was reading it about the, they leave the mass and then they think about um, a cosmopoiesis, because you, you talked about the Christian identity of more in terms of reference to the Imago Dei uh, as a sort of lodestone. Um, and you, you spoke about the Augustinian influences at the same time that put kind of a restraint. So there's a dialectic of dreaming, but also attention to limits that we've also talked about in our seminar. 
But what about liturgy and liturgy as a serious play or liturgy as cosmopoiesis um, or the world envisioned by the mass, especially in, in, you know, in Eastern traditions of the liturgy where the, the, the visual, uh, the, the, the model is that in the liturgy, in the divine liturgy, or we would in Catholic traditions, the mass, the heaven and earth are brought together. Right? It's a moment of earth entering heaven or heaven coming down to earth where the ideal and the real, it's a moment of fusion where you're performing something together that in European history has started the genesis of where theatrical traditions come from just as a matter of historical fact. I mean, we have the classical tradition in Greece, but we also have the passion plays in medieval Europe and there's scholarship about the connection from that to Shakespeare. So what it, do you think that, would it be right to call Moore's, an, another aspect of Moore's Christian identity, that this is paraliturgical in some way. And is that, an, is that a way to think about in the contemporary moment, um, you know, secularism sometimes says, well, we have people who have religious beliefs and people with non-religious beliefs, and then we put those beliefs aside and then we have our marketplace of ideas and we talk about them in a secular domain. But if we, rewrote that sort of model. Instead it was, we have different liturgies. We have different models of practice. And these can, because they're practical, they can be sort of overlapping. And I can have certain practices and regimes of, of uh, things that I do during the week that engage Christian liturgy, but also other practices of virtue in the world. And then others can have other you know, intersecting ones that they're not so, complex and this is a way to think past the barrier between secular or theocratic politics which is uh, something like that what do you what do, what do you think of that I mean maybe you can speak just for a few minutes we're kind of at our time for break sorry to drop that question on your doorstep but any initial any initial thoughts about um, what makes more Christian in that way and whether liturgy is the right way to go or, or whether that's not a good way to go I'm extremely sympathetic to that and yeah that's um, you, you, I'm out of my depth in the sense that I'm not a theologian, and I, w I would uh, I would want to hear more from from you and from from other people who are more familiar with with the theological dimensions of this. I did begin by saying that Moore's Utopia starts with him going to mass. To your point, so I think part of the way I read that is that he needs to be reformed. So since since we're engaging the Catholic tradition here, and we're thinking about what does utopia mean in relationship to it. Um, here we have this canonized saying to the church, he invented the term utopia. He starts utopia with his political project failed. He goes to mass. He goes to mass. You go to mass, people don't say to you, um, you know, they don't stand at the door and say, don't come in here. They don't stand. Now, some people unfortunately do this. They say, do you really get this Eucharist or not? But, uh, but oftentimes the experience of a Catholic parish at the grassroots levels, you go in, no one asks. No one asks. It's just given. It's freely offered beauty, music, language, truth, hopefully. I guess the homily can sometimes go off the rails, but hopefully some truth. Um, and then, and, and participation, food freely offered, um, Christ's body freely offered, God's body freely offered. And then you go back out into the world and you're like, whoa, nothing is freely offered here. Nothing is freely offered. I'm not looked at with dignity. And so I do think that more does that intentionally? I mean, it's a very strange detail to put in that he goes to mass before he runs into Raphael Heithlade, and Heithlade is about to challenge him on Europe's way of being in community. Raphael is the name of an archangel, and so it's a messenger saying, more, more, are you living in a way that God would recognize? Is Europe um, in the 16th century living in a way that God would recognize? No, you need to imagine better you need to live better. And so, and so far as what you're saying is that the, the, the liturgies, there's more to what you're saying because you're saying the liturgies habituate us to desire, virtue, et cetera, I'll leave that aside. But in so far as already the liturgy is a lived form of communion that is a challenge or contrast to the kinds of communion we make when we go back to our families, our neighborhoods, our cities, then yes, very much so. I think that um, more, it sees utopia as an effort. I see in the comments, Ben saying Jesus himself was a radical imaginer. The parables I think are proto-utopian. I think more is a gloss on Jesus's parables. His parables are always about why don't you live this way? And I also see Cindy in the comments 
Catholic social teaching tells us you imagine from the perspective of the poor with a preferential option for the poor. You don't just imagine from your backyard in Beverly Hills, you go to the poor and then you imagine what would it look like to live like the Imago Dei, right? Because it could be that the rich already live like they're in the image of God, right? Um, but they treat the poor like they're just garbage or animals. And so the problem becomes, how do we also include them in the Imago Dei, in the participation in communion? So yes, I, I very much agree. There's more than I, than I understand in your question and there's more to get to, but I, I do think that more puts the mass in the dialogue for a reason, similar to what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you for um, this great conversation, Jason, and for kicking us off with such a great uh, window in, a new pathway in, at least it was for me, into thinking about all the things at stake and more and how we can, you know, we're trying to also work together to develop our own skills, our own techne at working with the Catholic tradition, but also knowing that our feet are in the 21st century. And how do we, how do we manage that? And what's the art of of finding something that's not a, a mirror reflection of ourselves either, but something that's different, that makes a difference in the way that we think in the present. So thank you for a good tutorial in the art of doing that so well. Let's take a short break with some, maybe some more virtual applause for Jason, if I could curate. And um, we'll take a short break and we'll, let's come back in about 10 minutes and then we'll introduce our guest, Father Greg. <laughs> 